Dr. Franson, let me tell you a little about her. We're pleased to have her today. Uh, she is the Director of Neuroscience, Neuro Studies minor and an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology at Longwood University in Farmville, Virginia. She's a broadly trained neuroscientist and her current research is in behavioral neuroendocrinology, examining how environmental enrichment can reduce stress and anxiety and improve cognition. Her research has been published in top academic journals, including Nature, Neuroscience, Neuroscience, Brain Research, Stress, Journal of Neuroendocrinology, and even more. Her scientific writing and research has been featured regularly in popular press articles and publications, including CNN, Huffington Post, Scientific American, Salon, Parents, Motherly, and more. Dr. Franson holds a PhD in neurobiology from the University of Chicago. Just a few more nitty gritties before I turn it over to Dr. Franson. Um, again, we'll keep everybody on mute. Put your questions in the chat box uh, and I'll make sure we get them to Dr. Franson. If you have to leave us for any uh, moment, we are recording today's session and this will go up on our YouTube site uh, soon after today's presentation. Remember, everybody can read what you're typing, so be friendly and respectful to all of your shared guests. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Franson. Hi, thank you, Tim Schull, and thank you so much to all of you for, for being here today. Uh, this is the first kind of uh, talk like this I've done, although I've had a little, little bit of teaching over on, online so far this semester. The, topic that we're going to be talking a little bit about today is neuroscience and nature. And so I wanted to share with you a couple of a couple of things uh, about my journey to get to this moment. So I found that throughout my life, I have been a student of the human experience. I was one of those children that probably drove my parents crazy asking why, why, why. And a lot of my questions had to do with why are we different? Why do we experience the world in different ways? Why do we have different reactions to the exact same thing? Someone can say something and two different people are going to have completely different responses to it. And so I've always wondered a lot about why uh, we experience the world so differently as individuals. And why we have many many similarities. As I went to college at Randolph-Macon College in Ashland, Virginia, uh, maybe there's a few yellow jackets of you out there, hello, um, and um, I began to learn a little bit about the field of neuroscience. I had started out as a psychology major um, and I was learning a lot about why people are different and things about our experience. Um, and Dr. Kelly Lambert introduced me to some of the questions of neuroscience which weren't just why but also how. How are we experiencing things inside of our brain? How do we how do we experience the world and react to it and behave to it and and I, I learned in college um, that we could actually begin to define what some of those differences are and to understand what underlies the why. So I became tremendously fascinated with this field of neuroscience and it has been a couple of decades and I am still fascinated. I'm hooked, hooked for life on the brain. One of the things that, that I learned and that, and that is something that will, will capture me for perhaps my entire life is that the brain can change because of the experiences you have. When we have experiences out in the world, we can constantly be, uh, be changing our brain. And you guys know this. A lot of you are, um, are science museum enthusiasts. And you go to our beautiful science museum so that you can have experiences, you can learn new things. And what we find is when we have these experiences and learn new things, we are constantly changing then how we experience new information and how we respond to the world around us. 
Um, so you guys, most of you know this, this already, but it's, it's something that bears reminding because when we think about how do, how do you change your brain? How do you change your world? How do you change your behavior? You can shape it little bits every single day. So how do we shape it? How do we change it? And this is something that, um, that I've been fascinated with for a long time. My family loves to, um, to, to visit zoos. So not just museums, but also zoos. And for those of you guys out there, maybe you visit zoos um, and you've seen the different kinds of environmental enrichments that are present out there for all kinds of animals. And they make us all healthier, happier, smarter, and we see that in habitats, but also in our own home with our pets, our children, and even ourselves. When we create an enriched environment for ourselves, then we can experience um, the, the benefits of that experience. So we've known this for a long time that enriched environments can affect lots of parts of the brain some of the the key researchers marianne diamond and uh, rosenzweig and some of the other researchers were doing this work back in the 1950s and really over the last 70 years lots of neuroscience and behavioral researchers have been studying what is it about an enriched environment that changes our brain and how can it continue to alter and change. What I'm showing you here on this slide is um, it's, a, it's a little cartoon of mice that are in this cage and they have all these different kind of toys to play with. And so this mouse that's interacting with an object is um, is is it is looking at things it's seeing different shapes and and um and 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 so forth and that's enriching the visual parts of the brain this other mouse that's running on a running wheel um it, we're seeing enhancements in motor regions of the brain as well as balance and coordination there are lots of cognitive benefits of an enriched environment that will um, improve an animal's ability to solve problems, to think ahead, to strategize, um, and, and so forth. And we're actually going to be talking a little bit more about that today. Um, and then um, over here in the other corner is a mouse that's sort of climbing on a little grate that's balanced in a, in, um, in a seesaw kind of a way. And that's improving its somatosensory cortex um, and regions of the brain. So the, that animal is um, getting stimulation of different touch sensations, different tactile, different textures. And that um, actually causes the brain to grow and change in different ways. This is just a, a brief summary of some of the changes that are instigated by an enriched environment and, um, and has been studied in thousands of studies over the, like I said, the past 70 years or so by neuroscientists, psychologists, biologists um, around the world. We're looking here um, at the, this next slide and thinking a little bit about these benefits of environmental enrichment. And what we are looking at here, again, it's another sort of cartoon, and we have some mice that are housed in a standard condition. These mice have, they, they have what seems like a good life. They've got, they've got some, some bedding to lay in, they've got food and water as much as they want, and nothing to mess with or worry about. Well, um, what, and then we see this other cage where there is environmental en enrichment, a little bit like what we've looked at on the previous cartoon of different kinds of stimulations. It turns out that this environmental enrichment will cause a change in brain plasticity. So plasticity, meaning plastic, changeable, the, the idea that your brain can grow and change. And it grows and change throughout 
our lives. And so when we, when uh, we're, we're seeing an animal in this enriched environment, then it is growing, its brain is growing and changing. What that means is that cognitive performance will change. Cognitive performance can include all kinds of things for the mouse. That might mean being able to solve a maze faster. For us, it might be um, things like um, having a better memory or whether that's a short-term memory or a long-term memory. Underneath that, getting to that question of like sort of how and is that happening? Um, what's, you know, what's, what else is happening? In the brain, we have these neurons and neurons grow and change and they grow and change throughout our lives. Um, and even from day to day, we can see them branching and growing. We may not be getting brand new neurons very often, but, but the neurons that we have are changing shape. A little bit like a plant that might be growing in an undernourished situation or with lots of water, light and nourishment. Right? So, um, and so what we see is this, this neuron that atrophies and, um, and we may see cell death if the, um, if the animal is spending a lot of time in, um, in a, in a non-enriched environment versus more enrichment, we see the, this, what's called neurogenesis, the creation of new neurons as well as synaptic plasticity. That's that plasticity, growth and change of synapses. Synapses are the connections between neurons. Um, and so, and the connections, that's where it's at. That's where, that's where the intelligence is, is not just how many neurons you have, but how well connected that they are. And uh, we also see an improvement in growth factors. Growth factors are sort of these cellular molecules that we have in our brain that are sort of like uh, miracle grow for your brain. The growth factors are chemicals that help your brain cells to, to grow and, and can create new connections better and better all the time. Um, we the next piece that we have that we're going to get into a little bit more, and here's where we're going to get a little bit more into the environmental enrichment of the environment of nature, is talking a little bit about stress. We found that, um, so, so as this, this graphic uh, shows us, in the lab standard conditions, there, um, there's, there's a reduction of cognitive performance like memory and planning um, and, and brain atrophy that's happening that goes along with that. But what also happens in those conditions is that we have a lack of control of our stress responses. And that improves with environmental enrichment. Now I'm going to talk about what that means over the next several slides and think a little bit about um, about what the what better control of our stress is. So to do that, let's go visit some mice in a lab. Um, and this is a mostly standard housing. These are Paramiscus maniculatus. These are white-footed mice. They're really similar to some that, um, like field mice that you might see um, around Virginia. And, um, and they, they are predominant throughout most of North America. There's a couple of different species that are really similar to each other, but these are the little brown mice with the white belly on them. So you've probably seen those around. Um, these then, um, we looked at um, that these guys in some environmentally enriched housing. We've done a, a whole series of studies, and so some of the pictures that you'll see will come from from different different phases of the studies. Um, but this one, we've got lots of toys and things included into this standard environment um, here. So this is a more this is an artificial 
elements that are enriching that cage. And here we have sort of a more of a terrarium setting. And so we've got our little mouse that is, that's, that's in a terrarium that's a little bit more um, of the elements that they would find, that their species would find in nature. Things to climb on, hide under, um, ma manipulate, touch, play with, that would all be relatively similar to um, what they might see. So we're comparing and contrasting kind of the standard caging with some of the, um, you know, with these different environments. We've also done a similar study with a standard lab rat. This is a hooded Long Evans rat. A um, little bit, I think, a little bit cuter than some of the, the all-white albino rats, but um, that's but those are, those are, those are kind of nice. Again, we can compare those rats housed in sort of more of a standard lab environment, an artificial, artificially enriched environment, lots of toys to play with, a naturally enriched environment, things that they can um, manipulate, climb on, play with, dig under, and so forth um, that are more natural. And then in this particular study, we actually had a blended enrichment environment where they had a combination of both of those. Throughout a lot of these studies that we, uh, that we worked on over the course of several years, we looked at a couple of different things. The hippocampus is a region in the brain that is involved um, primarily with learning and memory. And we found that um, in both of the enriched environments that the hippocampus, there are some slices of the brain that are stained that we can quantify and work with, um, that those, the hippocampi um, ha, were, were altered. They were improved um, with more cells, more connections, more dense connections um, throughout that learning and memory region. Um, another uh, thing that we looked for was the was was a, a chemical called nestin, which marks cells for that are growing and changing. So we're looking for plasticity specifically right here, and we're seeing that the animals that were housed in the, the natural enriched environment were more neuroplastic. Their neurons were changing shape a lot more often than the animals housed in other environments. So becoming more flexible, more creative, problem solving in new and different ways. Here we were looking at some other other cells in the brain called glia. Glia are supporting cells for the neurons. And um, in this particular region that we looked at where we found um, the naturally enriched to be to be higher, um, they actually had this this is a region of the brain that's involved with problem solving. And so that this shows some of that underlying cellular changes that are happening that show us that animals um, housed in these enriched environments, these naturally enriched environments, playing with real things um, are better at problem solving. How do you test problem solving in a rat? A couple of different ways. Um, this is one example. This is called the novel object preference task. And what you do is you give them two objects. So here we have, this is, this is an upside down, this is just like a little candle holder that you would buy at Target or something. I'm pretty sure that's what it is and that we found it. And we stuck it down in their cage um, to see if they noticed, um, if, to, to see what they did. And we just measure how much time did they pay, pay attention to it. You pull those two out and then you stick it back in with another little um, contraption. This is a little, it's it's half of a, a tea strainer that we um, had screwed onto to a, a plate for another experiment. It was just, we just grabbed it and stuck it in there, but it was new and different. Well, animals who notice and play with new stuff more, they are, they're more curious, they're, they're, they're more aware, they're playing with something that's new and different, um, and they're spending longer time looking at it um, and noticing. So that's some of how we notice that their problem solving and their cognition is changing. And we did find that to be um, 
to be to be improved. Another way that we can look at cognition is a maze, and I showed you a picture of another maze earlier. This is what's called a dry land maze. Um, it's a it's it's kind it's about like a six foot diameter. It's kind of like a little kid's swimming pool, um, and um, and in fact, a long time ago when we first started this, we actually used a little six six foot like kid's swimming pool um, to for the first thing. What we have are little um, little wells, little cups in there um, that are that are screwed to the bottom, um, about the size of like a like a Coke bottle cap or something. Um, and then drop down inside of there are parts of Fruit Loops. Rats love Fruit Loops. Just a little factoid for you there, a little random trivia. For, <laughs> um, and so they love those Fruit Loops. And what we can do is we can measure how quickly they learn the location of those Fruit Loops. You can take, you can, you know, you put them in there and maybe you only have one Fruit Loop in one space. How fast do they learn where that is and remember it the next time they go in um, and those kinds of things. So it doesn't seem like a maze necessarily the way that we typically think of a maze, but it's a really neat, um, interesting way of testing um, cognition and memory in some of these animals. And we do find that the um, that the, those animals that, that were housed with natural objects, um, that they were actually faster to find that Fruit Loop um, and eat them. We and and our our presumption here is that they're not only improved on cognition as we had talked about earlier, so they're solving this faster. But a lot of what we studied was that their patterns of moving around in this open field, this dry field, is um, dry land maze, is bolder. They're more exploratory. They're more willing to run around and look for things um, and, and really excited to, to get involved in like hunting for new things. So there's some, some pieces of that. Some other evidence of that bold exploratory things are um, that rats, uh, rats do not love water. They're kind of like cats like that. You you toss them in water. They can swim, totally capable of it. They just don't like it. They wouldn't choose to swim if they didn't have to. A lot of what they do once they're, when they're tossed into water is they just float. But one of the cool things that, that some of these animals will do is they'll dive to look for an alternate escape. Um, and this is, it's a it's an unusual behavior that we don't um, often see, but we actually saw a lot of those dives with animals that had been housed in the natural environment. So they were, you know, we call this like the James Bond kind of thing. I don't know, one of those movies where, where there, he's like trapped in the submarine that's sinking or something. They've got to like dive down to find an exit instead of like going up. So it's thinking outside the box. It's a creative new strategy um, to escape from the, from the situation. It's really an, a, another more evidence on how bold and exploratory these animals are that have spent time in the natural enriched environment. Um, just a touch more on this evidence, and then we'll we'll take a little pause. Um, rats, mice, rodents, etc. They are pretty scared of this. This is this beautiful open field, and it looks lovely for us. But for a rodent, this is terrifying because you can't see where the hawk is coming from. There's a lot of space until um, you can hide in the trees from an owl um, or hawk or other aerial um, predator. Um, so, or potentially a land predator as well. But this is a, it's a little bit nerve wracking. It's a little, it's a little anxiety producing. We can mimic that in the lab with what's called um, an open field test. So it's just anytime there's a sort of a big open field. And what happens is that mice and rats, they sort of huddle in the corner and they're because they don't want to be out in the center of that field because it's scary. That's something they just naturally do. That, that's sort of more of an anxiety effect. Um, I'm, I, there's no immediate threat or predator, but it's, but it's sort of a measure of how anxious they are. 
an immediate threat um, would be the actual um, presence of a specific predator. So um, we can mimic that in the lab with a couple of different things. One of the things that we've used is fox urine um, and fox urine can be purchased um, for for deer hunters to, to mask that human scent um, but also for other um, yeah for mostly for most mostly for hunting purposes it smells pretty terrible gotta tell you but the um, but it will kind of serve as a as an immediate cue for the uh, rats and mice that a fox might be near so it's more of an uh, a fear response that's different from the anxiety response of the open field. So those are two different responses, fear and anxiety, sort of immediate versus more general. Um, what's interesting is that the animals that are housed in that natural environment, those that have spent more time with nature, they have less of a response to the anxiety, the more generalized threat. They can, re they can relax and explore that open field a little bit better um, and they're not, they recover from that stress faster and easier. They don't mount as big a stress response and they, ha um, and, and they recover from it faster. With the predator odors, what they actually do is they have a, they have a bigger response, but it's a a bigger response that, that recovers really quickly. Well, that's a lot more natural. If there's something af that you should be afraid of, boy, you need, to, you need to get that stress response up and running really quickly and then bring it back down to baseline so you can, so you can chill out and, and deal with the next one. Um, versus animals that are housed in the sort of lab standards, a lot of them are just kind of going along at this mid grade level of anxiety and every little thing kind of freaks them out uh, the same. Um, and so when we, when I mentioned several slides ago that the environmental enrichment changes the stress response and we have a, an improved stress response, we don't always mean less stress. What we mean is a stress response that better fits the situation. You don't want to have the same freak out to, you know, um, falling, you know, out or, or having, having some kind of immediate stress, somebody jumps out at you and yells and, uh, you know, that's a different stress response than, you know, worrying about um, a, a, an exam or a mortgage bill or something like that. Those are those are important things to worry about, but we want to, our bodies to respond a little bit differently with different stress responses and, and different amounts so that we don't have long-term health consequences. That's a whole other story. So we'll touch on that just a little bit. All right, so I'll summarize this, this piece for, for us a little bit. And what we've learned from some of these animals that are housed in natural environments um, is that, they have improved cognition, so they're thinking better. They have better problem solving abilities. They have increased neuroplasticity. So their brains are, the, the neurons in, are, are growing and changing shape and having different connections. They have this Im increased boldness and exploration. Um, and their glucocorticoid levels, their stress hormone levels are altered some up some down but better fitting the scene, the scene that they're that they're looking for they seem to have a more appropriate threat assessment so they can better understand what an immediate threat is and what's a generalized um, anxiety response so to translate that over to humans then we want to think about spending time playing outside. Now, not a lot of these images are children, but it's true for adults as well. Like I mentioned earlier in the talk, our brains continue to, sh to grow and change and, and be shaped throughout our lives. And spending time outside or even just indoors, but playing with some natural elements um, uh, or interacting with natural elements, having plants and, and gardening things um, indoors, stones, rocks, all kinds of things can make you smarter, bolder, more flexible, and all kinds of great things. So, right. 
yeah, Dr. Franson, I have some questions for you at this point. Sure, sure. So that was a, that was a good, because uh, I think that slide answered some, one of the questions we had is what were the implications of rat neural enhancement in, in a naturally enhanced environment for humans? Should we all be spending more time in nature? And I think you hit the nail on the head with that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Okay, what, uh, what else can I help um, with? So we, uh, another question was, did male or female rats have a better result living in the uh, enhanced enriched environment? Um, it's a really good question. We tried to look at both, um, which is which is challenging um, to 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 study both males and females. Unfortunately, uh, females get left out of a lot of these kinds of studies. Um, they what we saw was that was that actually both were were having were having really great, interesting responses to these natural environments. There's a lot of there's a lot of really interesting things on uh, that I, I've spent some of my career looking at um, the effects of, of parenthood and sort of the, the natural enrichment of like interacting with kids and how that changes our brain, our, our brains, um, both for mothers and fathers, as well as, you know, foster parents and um, uh, people who spend a lot of time with kids and so forth. And all of that will grow and change and, and shape our brains as well. Um, so it's, it's not just outdoors. There's lots of things that can, can change our brains. Um, and so we see in a lot of these different studies, it, it just kind of, it kind of depends, but everybody can benefit from the nature part of it. Cool. And I got one, one, one more real quick, and then um, I'll let you keep going. Yeah. Um, there was another question that asked where you measure, able to measure effects in terms of pain development in rats in natural versus non-natural environments. Pain development. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Stay tuned for like two slides from now, <laughs> and I'll talk about pain. <laughs> that's all an right. excellent question. That, that's so great. That means that means we're all in sync. We're 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 working together. We we know what. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about let's talk about pain. All right. All right. So I'm gonna let you keep going then. Okay. Super. Um, okay. So we're sh shifting gears here just a, a little bit. That was the that was the long chunk. The um, uh, and then I've got a couple of, of shorter chunks of information to share with you. Um, this in the second sort of half of the talk. Um, here we're going to talk a little bit about how nature improves your health and your mood, um, and often can give us a little a little perspective as well. Um, there's a there's this classic study from, uh, it was done by, by Robert Ulrich back in um, 1984, and he was studying patients as they recovered from gallbladder surgeries. And he was able to observe patients that had um, a view out the window of their, of a natural setting versus those who were um, either like in a room that didn't have a window. He even, he did some other studies of, of patients that were on the, the inner side, like not next to the window um, and so forth. And what he found um, in that study, in that, in that classic study, was that the view through a window, being able to see scenes of nature actually influenced the recovery from surgery. There's been, there's been a number of studies that have replicated this finding um, and done so in, a, in different ways, but they find that when patients can see nature, they require less pain medication, they have less anxiety, their um, muscle tension, lots of other factors of recovery are influenced. I think I've got a little bit more on this next uh, page here. So when we view nature from a window, when we view scenes of nature, um, and, uh, and when we are out in nature, all of those things affect our physical health. Um, it does seem that, um, so, we, so we see a reduction in pain and discomfort, and you can measure that with um, both with like surveys of how much pain that people that patients report, but you can also measure it with um, how much pain medications that, that they request um, and you can can monitor that and it seems like you know in some ways that we find trees, plants, water, and other elements of nature to be 
engrossing. Like, uh, so our, our brain, our cognitive parts of our brain become absorbed into na nature scenes in a slightly different way than we do with man-made scenes. Um, and what, and it, and it sort of distracts, it, it pulls the attention from the pain processing regions of our brain uh, so that we're actually like giving it a little bit less um, information um, to, to those pain processing regions. It's a, um, pain, pain is an incredibly fascinating thing to study um, and, and how we can distract and, and cause all kinds of, of different ways to pull attention away from pain, at least temporarily, to, to find some, some relief. Um, in some other studies related to this, uh, folks have looked at viewing natural scenes that will um, cause decreases in anger, fear, and stress. Um, a lot of those things are measured through survey results, but also can be measured um, through facial expressions um, and through hormones like stress hormones um, to, to look at more biometric pieces. While we're talking about biometric measurements, nature, uh, whether we're in it or observing it or connected with it in one way or another, tons of different studies so um, it's hard for you know I'm not going to narrow it down to this one thing but um, a lot of those studies are show will show decreases in blood pressure heart rate and muscle tension um, I've done a little bit of of that work uh, but but lots and lots of folks have have done that work and um, nature will definitely improve things I know I have a window over here and I find that I will take a deep breath, look out the window when, especially when like a stressful email comes in or anything like that, take a deep breath, look out and see if I can get that blood pressure to come down before I, uh, before I respond too quickly to, to some people. A few more pieces um, on how nature changes our, our mood and our health. Um, the visual regions of our brain will, they, it's like they make a different calculation when observing um, a, a scene that is na natural versus artificial. And, um, and it seems to hold those scenes with a different valence or reward. So a natural scene is very rewarding than an, an, um, and, and even more rewarding than an artificial or a man-made scene. We hold it in very high regard. And that, that kind of calculation is happening subconsciously based on um, the visual regions of the brain and the reward pathways of your brain. The limbic system is a part of the brain involved in the rewards. Um, I've mentioned stress hormones a couple of times. That's it's an area of, of my own expertise, and I'm trying not to, to, to stay totally uh, in, in that uh, research world today, but um, natural sounds have certain pitches, frequencies, wave patterns, and harmonics uh, that we identify as, as a sound that exists in nature versus artificial. Um, and those natural sounds will um, also have been shown, shown to reduce stress hormones like cortisol or glucocorticoids. I, I mentioned before, glucocorticoids is the version that's found in non-human animals and cortisol is found in humans. Um, many man-made sounds like traffic and other things can actually um, cause increases in those stress hormones. So sight, sound, um, other senses as well um, will play a role. Textures, the sand between our toes, different kinds of things. Smells are incredibly important to, um, to, our, to our sensation. And with all of those senses, we also are thinking about experiences in nature that trigger nostalgia. Nostalgia is a specific kind of memory that is emotionally tied within our brain. It's, a, it, it's shaped differently in our brain um, and, uh, because it's so intricately tied with emotions. Um, so nostalgia will actually um, 
recall help us recall sensations of happiness relaxation security other positive experiences from say a vacation or travel in nature or something like that um, and and nature seems to elicit those whether it's through smells sounds sights we um, are it ties right into that nostalgia memory pathway so um, if nature is so good for your health and mental health can we use it as a therapy this is i think is really really interesting now the insurance companies probably going to be reluctant to pay for you know going outside right but um but could we could we develop some therapy that would
executive functioning, we talked a lot about cognitive functioning, and the executive functioning is the frontal lobes that do the stuff, um, the, the brain and stuff, and that includes being able to control the public movement, organizing and prioritizing, working memory, and self-management, um, all of those things can be kind of like a, it's a real quick plug for exercise is good for your brain, and you can get that double benefit by being long and advanced in nature um, and exercising and yeah, you just get all of all of the pieces together that we've talked about today. So I'll stop there and I'm happy to answer some questions. Um, very nice. Thank you, Dr. Franson. Um, got a lot of thank yous. Um, uh, I'm trying to see if there's any questions that I missed that folks um, didn't ask. Oh, here's one. Uh, so one example, one question we just got was, um, do you think that children in places like Italy who have spent two months quarantined entirely inside will ex experience long lasting effects? Um, I think perhaps some might, but I would guess that most will not. Um, hopefully many of them are at least spending time, um, playing and interacting, looking out the windows, um, and, and trying to, uh, trying to interact in, in different ways. I've seen a lot of images of people with plants on their little patios and stuff. I know my brother and his family, they, they just relocated for a job last fall and, and are, are in a temporary, um, apartment. And he, in, and he said, you know, it's, it's tough to be in a temporary apartment. They're here in the States, but um, they have a small little balcony and, the, you know, the kids sort of run in and outside out and um, they've got different plants and things going on. So I think as much as families and, and teachers and everyone can do to, to help, um, help facilitate the, the better that they can be. Children's brains are very plastic and they're continuing to change. So I would guess the younger they are, the more likely they are to get get past that. Um, but yeah, I think that's, yeah, interesting question. I'll have to think about it a little bit more. Um, I've got a few folks who've also asked um, if you could share uh, where they could find out more and read your study. Oh, yeah. Well, there's, uh, I talked about a bunch of different studies and um, let's see here. I'm trying to think of the best ways to share those. Um, you can certainly email me um, and I have a website um, that, I mean, if you just Google me, you should be able to find the, the university website. A bunch of, a bunch of my studies are posted there and I will try to update them. I, I know some of my more recent stuff is not posted there, but um, which is, yeah. I'm happy to, to share any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, hold on, let me check and see if there's anything else that, a uh, lot of good comments. Uh, once again, we're recording all of this. So if you wanna watch it again or uh, revisit, uh, you absolutely can. Um, I think we got most of the questions. Uh, Dr. Francis, thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure having you uh, lead this talk. Um, I have, so there's a bunch of comments on here that say we can't wait to get outside, and, uh, <laughs> which I think is exactly what you wanted. Uh, um, that's right. And if you guys are enjoying this, join us next week, same day, same time at noon on the 13th Wednesday. We'll be back, and this time it'll be a Digital Dinosaurs Fact or Fiction. Um, and, and we will see you then. Stay safe and healthy, everybody. Bye now. Bye. Thank you.